um, to finish on time and I might even sort of say to Xiao Dong, Xiao Dong, how, do you want, how long do you want me to talk for today? Uh, 50 minutes, one hour. Okay, so I'll try, and, I'll try and keep to within 50 minutes. Um, and I, I, I know that sort of seems like I'm talking about the wrong thing, but honestly, if you give a bad talk but you finish on time, at least you finished on time. Um, it really is, you know, the worst kind of talk is a bad talk that runs over. So it's really important to finish on time. And then the next most important thing is to make sure that your audience understands something. Something, not everything, something. Not everything you've done, not every single piece of work you've done in your life, something. They have to leave with something. Um, and the only other rule is I honestly think there are no other rules. Um, so uh, you'll notice, by the way, that I've got my phone sitting here. Uh, it's got the time, and I will sort of nervously glance at it every now and then. Uh, and that's sort of my goal, is to sort of how to try to make sure that I finish on time. And we'll maybe talk about some other tricks that you can use or other things that you might sort of want to think about um, later on. So this was the bit actually that I had really very little idea about um, about giving talks, and I realized that I don't do this very much, um, is to place a structure um, on a talk. Um, and it was actually, I was talking to my wife, I'm very lucky, um, uh, if there's any tip I can give you in your life, it's to marry an English teacher. Um, <laughs> because they have a set of skills uh, that we as computer scientists don't have. Uh, I'm very lucky, I'm married to a very good English teacher, um, and she has helped me with all sorts of things, with writing uh, research proposals. So, you know, she sort of taught me how to write exciting text. And then we went for a walk last weekend. I said, I've got a talk to give uh, about how to give research talks. And she said, oh, well, so you're going to talk about sort of talk structure then? And I was like, um, um, am I? Um, and she said, well, you know what? Talks are different from other things. So if I'm reading a paper and I don't understand something, I can go back. If I'm watching Netflix and I don't understand something, as I get older, I can't hear it properly. I hit this button all the time. What was it they said? Oh, sorry, what was that plot point? You know, what was that complicated thing in The Expanse that I didn't really understand? Or, you know, uh, I can just hit that reverse button. Or indeed, if there's something boring, can I skip ahead? Um, there's none of that in the talk. Um, and so she said to me, so it's, it's critical when you're giving a speech or when you're giving a talk um, that you have to provide what she called discourse markers. And that's what I'm trying to do in the talk today is to sort of, I gave you a table of contents and then I've got these nice colored slides. You know, uh, I can even sort of show you that. Ah, no, let's not do that actually. Um, but um, uh, then we'll come back to that one. Uh, so you've got these discourse markers which are uh, indicators of where we are in the talk, right? So we're in the bit on, uh, on discourse markers and on talk structure. Um, and then she said, there's a couple of things you really need to do. She said, you know, when you get to the end of a section, you need to recap. Um, and she also talked about uh, the idea of repetition as well. And she said the repetition was very important. Um, so um, I sort of got very nervous because I thought I don't really have very much to talk about. So I thought, well, do you know what I'm going to do at this point? I'm actually going to show them a, uh, why is that not moving forward? I'm going to show them a video. Now, I tried to embed this, oh gosh, is that going to work? Let's see. Uh -huh. So I thought I would show you a video where I think somebody did a rather good job of doing recapping. It lasts for about four minutes. Uh, and you will also see that they, uh, that they also do a rather a lot of repetition, but you'll see uh, what I mean by that. Let's see if this works. Here is. <laughs> so I should apologize. This is about a 10-year-old YouTube video, so the resolution is pretty terrible, but you get the idea. <laughs>
and then he told you how you were moving through each of those different sections by going back to that table of contents. Um, and there was certainly a level of repetition there. Uh, so this is a guy called Doug Zonker. He gave his talk at a major science meeting about 10 years ago in the US. He also wrote a paper, if you type chicken, chicken, chicken into Google Scholar, you'll find a paper written by him uh, with the words chicken, chicken repeated uh, throughout. And it's got 28 citations. Um, um, so it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of lampooning an ideal talk, but in many ways it's not a bad talk. Um, you know, it, 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 what does it do? It, um, it gives you a table of contents, it tells you what's coming, it, 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 um, it gives you a little bit of past work, it uh, threw up some sort of questions, and then he had that sort of big box that sort of threw out what the key research question of his talk was going to be. And then he went through these structures, so he talked about, um, you know, he showed some results, he had a scatter plot, he had some a diagram, which was pre presumably some development of something, and then there was some uh, graph where he was fitting data to, uh, to some lines or something like that, and then he had his conclusions. Um, and so it's a nice example of a talk that has a sort of a very straightforward structure. And it's, it's an easy thing to laugh at, and it's a good joke, but actually, if your talks look like that, and you finish on time, you know, that's actually entirely fine. Um, so this is this idea of discourse markers. These markers in a talk help the reader, help the listener understand where they are because they have to go at the pace that I'm going at. You have to guide them. You have to help them understand where they are in, in the development of your arguments, where you are in the talk. Um, he also, as you uh, very well saw, repeated uh, rather a lot, but that's sort of a, perhaps not a terribly interesting example of repetition. Um, does anybody know um, who this is? Yeah. I think it's Martin Luther King. Right, Martin Luther King. Anybody know what this speech might be that he was about to give? I have a dream. The I have a dream speech. So I was talking to my wife about this, and she was saying, you know, it's important to repeat stuff. Uh, and you'll see me repeat things a couple of times in this talk. Um, the word, the phrase, I have a dream, is repeated nine times in that speech. And that's one of the reasons why you remember it as the I have a dream speech. He says, I have a dream, nine times in the speech. And so it gets drilled home. So um, these are sort of tricks that she teaches her kids doing VCE English. But if, if, you know, if the goal of your talk is to get a particular message across, um, then there's nothing wrong with repeating things. You know, um, I've talked about um, the importance of finishing on time and getting some, some level of information across, and I think those are important, and I'm going to say them multiple times. And I'm also going to talk about how the fact that there are no other rules to giving talks. Um, uh, beyond what I've said, I've given you some ideas of some structures, but repetition is, is perfectly allowed. And one of the reasons why it's necessary in this form of presentation is because you don't have that, you don't have that ability to return back. Uh, you know, if, if, if you're writing a paper, you can have the title of the paper on every page, or you, know, you have different forms of emphasis going on. But in a spoken presentation, you don't have that. So one of your options is to repeat. So what have I done in this little section? I've told you a little bit about some, some, some tricks that you can use, these discourse markers I've talked about, um, uh, uh, the idea of uh, repetition, and then what am I doing now? I'm recapping. I'm recapping on what I've already described. So what else can we do? Um, well, we're going to talk a little bit about explaining stuff. 
Um, and this is, um, I think, very important to, to think about. Um, explaining stuff, particularly for what we do. So everyone here, everyone here is an expert. Um, probably, there's probably no one else in this country who knows as much as you do about what you're doing. Right, and, I, and I'm looking, I've told some of the students, some of my students who've just started out and they've read maybe 20, 30 papers. If you've read 20 or 30 papers on some topic, there is probably no one else in the country who's read those particular papers. And you are an expert. And so that's a very challenging thing for us as researchers. And also, if you're a PhD student, you're entering into like a new period in your life. Uh, when you were an undergraduate, people like me knew more than you. When you were a master's student, people like me knew more than you. Now, you know more than me. I guarantee you know more than me. You know, Johanna is one of my students, uh, Layla's one of my students, Valeria's up the back there is one of my students, I'm probably missing some other people. Billy's there. They all know more than me on their particular topics. Right, and it'll be the same for you and your supervisors. So that makes it difficult um, when you're explaining stuff. Um, because you have to recognize that you're an expert and that you need to explain to people in a way that you've never had to do that before. You, if you've ever had to give a presentation, you can always assume that the person who's marking you knows more than you. Not anymore. And so that changes. Um, that changes the way that you give a presentation. So you have to think about who your audience is. By default, in the past, you assumed your audience were experts. Not now. You know, when you're giving a presentation, uh, you need to be asking yourself, what do these people know? I, 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 was, I was with uh, Kerr and myself. We were watching some students give presentations yesterday. They were honors and master's students presentations. And certainly my student, um, she talked about certain concepts. And at the end, one of the markers put his hand up and said, sorry, what, what, what does that concept mean? She just never crossed her mind that this person wouldn't know what, what this particular thing was. You know, because, you know, uh, this person is a smart, it's one of our academics, they're, they're, you know, they've got a PhD, they write loads of papers, they're very successful, but they don't work in that particular area. So you have to think about who your audience is and what, what they may or may not know. If you're giving a presentation like this, you have to assume that they're smart people and they're computer scientists, but that's about the limit. Um, if you go to a conference in your area, they know some of the basics of your area. You know, so when myself and Johanna or, you know, Layla or Valeria or, or Billy go to, Billy goes to Rexis conferences, these guys go to information retrieval conferences, they can make some basic assumptions about search engine technology that everybody else will know. But they probably can't assume that they know the specifics or the ins and outs of some of the technologies. So you need to think about what, who your audience is, and you also need to think about what the point of your talk is. This comes back to the point I made earlier about explain something. If you're giving a research presentation, that's what Jardong said at the start, this is the idea of giving you some idea about presenting to an audience, say, at a conference. I would say that the goal of that talk is to make people read your paper, not to make them understand everything you've done, get them excited, and get them going away to read your paper. You know, and so that doesn't mean that you then have to explain every concept, you just have to get them excited. You have to make them think there's something really cool going on. So focus on the interesting bits, focus on the good bits, and make sure that you get that bit explained. It may be that you have to bring them up to speed. I, I gave a talk at, at the big information retrieval conference this uh, uh, in, uh, in July in Paris, and I had to spend about 10 minutes of about 15 minutes just doing the groundwork on explaining the sort of the concepts that we were doing. We were using certain kinds of uh, relatively unknown statistical processes and I almost had to do a quick tutorial just to get people up to speed and then explain one aspect of the work just to make them think that there was something quite cool going on. So you need to think about who your audience is and what the goal of the talk is. Um, and then, you know, when you're talking about that work, you want to try and talk about it in some sort of a logical manner. You want to sort of make sure that people understand. And one of the great things about the chicken talk was that what you saw was this person was saying, 
you know, there is a problem and then they sort of pose a research question and then they sort of develop the tackling of that research question afterwards. So usually telling the story about how you came to this ultimate result that you're going to show them, it's usually worth telling that in some sort of chronological order, I find personally, telling things uh, as you encountered the challenges, what were the ways that you solved that. But you want to sort of develop the way that you're explaining things in some sort of logical way. And you want to make sure that people get some sort of takeaway. You want to make sure, you want to ask yourself what's going to be the takeaway of the, of the talk. Um, and you want to try and make sure that people get that takeaway. So I, I, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I do this rather a lot. So I already sort of said, you know, you're the experts. Do your audience understand? So do they understand terminology? Do they understand background? Do they understand motivation? You know, do they understand that there has been this thing that people have been worried about for years? Uh, you know, when I gave my talk at this information retrieval conference, several papers were published four or five years ago that were trying to solve a problem, but they couldn't solve it. But they're not that well known, those papers. So I had to sort of say, hey, we're solving a problem. You may not have heard about it, but let me explain to you why it's a really important problem to try and solve. So you need to ask yourself, what do I need to show to people to get them to, to, um, to understand? We've already talked about this, how much do you cover? You cover enough. You cover enough to get people to uh, understand something about your work and that you finish on time. Just some other things about explaining stuff. Um, I personally find that um, you know, graphs and worked examples can work very well in talks. Um, so you know, I could tell you in some text that search engines, which is my research area, uh, perform differently on different queries, and you know, performance variation is sometimes similar, sometimes it's not. I can say that, or I can show you three graphs. You know, and I can show you, and I can say, well, this is a bunch of search engines. These are actual search engines running on 50 different queries. So I've got the 50 queries, query number one, query number 50, actually maybe it's 49, I can't quite remember. And this is their performance, they're being measured using some sort of measure, and wow, look how different they are. But by the way, they're different, uh, but notice how there's some sort of similarity to the patterns here. So there's a peak here, and there's a peak here, there's two peaks up there, and so on. So um, notice how just by sort of showing examples, you can often sort of illustrate things in much more uh, engaging ways um, than if you showed them this kind of boring piece of text. Um, and if you're up for it, you can also try to explain, you know, through uh, animations or through examples. So this is something when I was at the Asian Summer School and in Information Access, I uh, got a, a, a built a little animation that showed how a search engine builds an index. So an index is this way that search engines search for information. What do they do? They basically build a back of the book index. You know that thing at the back with all the list of words that are alphabetically sorted and the list of pages that those words are in. And so roughly what they do is this. So if this is our document collection, it only has six documents in it. Let's just imagine these documents are just sort of six sentences. But if this is our collection, um, what the system will do if this animation works um, is you run through the collection uh, once. And you basically go and you work out how long the documents are. That's what that table is. And you work out how often each of the words occur in the collection as a whole, right? So you build this kind of structure. You pass through the collection once, you work out how long the documents are, you build all the words, you probably use something like, I don't know, a heap or a, some, or a, a hash table or something to build this structure. Uh, every time you encounter a word that's been repeated, you increment a counter. Um, and then after that, you then build this, now that you know how many times each word occurs, you can build a set of gaps in a file that will then be ready to hold the information about which documents those words occur in. And then, you know, you run through the, the collection again, filling out that, that index. Um, and that's sort of roughly how a search engine, uh, how a search engine uh, builds uh, it, its, uh, its data structures. And then uh, I've actually got some further animations, which I'll skip over, but they also show you how we go about running queries. So if you've got a query for these three words, um, then I built this animation that just showed how we actually work out which of the uh, uh, which of the documents to uh, to show to the user. I'll skip over it here, um, but you get the idea, and you can sort of do a nice job and sort of say, hey, in the end, we end up with this this set of uh, documents that we show to the user. 
in response to the query. Um, that took quite a lot of doing, putting that animation together. Um, in fact, I did it about 10 years ago, uh, but I keep reusing it. I'm looking at someone who works for a search engine company here. That's still roughly true, is it? Or yes. Okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> um, uh, and it's about a 10-year-old animation. Um, but, but, but something like that works very well. If, if, you know, if, if, you, if you're willing to take the time to explain things, using animations, using graphs, using examples works very strongly. Um, the other thing it hopefully does is it keeps your audience awake. Um, because you know, we, we live in a sort of a difficult time, you know, we've got sort of people checking their phones all the time, and particularly if you're at a conference, uh, those conferences go on for a long time, man, you know, and there's a bunch of people that are all jet lagged, they're all struggling to stay awake. And so the more you can do to just sort of keep things going and just make things more exciting, the more likely you will be to have people paying attention to you. So what have I done in this section? I've talked about explaining stuff. And the key thing I wanted to get across was this idea. Truly, you are experts. You know, by the time you get to write your PhD, you're not just an expert in the country, you're an expert in the world. You know, if you're doing your job properly as a PhD student, no one else in the world knows what you know. So you then have this new challenge, which is conveying that information to a bunch of smart people, but smart people who don't necessarily know why this problem is important, or who cares about this problem, or why it's challenging, or why the past attempts have failed, what it is about your solution that's really cool, you know, so you need to just take time and think about that and don't assume that everybody knows these things. Uh, and certainly, um, I think one of the reasons for the success, the moderate success that I have as an academic, is I think I'm reasonably good at explaining things. I think I'm reasonably good at explaining things. And I think I, I, I try to make sure the stuff is accessible to as many people as possible. Sometimes it makes my work seem a little trivial because if everyone can understand it, then... <laughs> doesn't sound very hard, but honestly, that's the right place to be, is, is, to, is to try to make sure that everybody understands. Um, and then I showed you some graphs and some animations um, that you know, can, I think, uh, uh, help a lot. All right, um, let's talk about you as a, as a presenter. Um, so I set out these two rules at the start, finish on time, and um, explain something. They seem very trite. But in order to explain something, at least something, you know, we've already talked about the importance of explaining stuff, but you also need to be someone who presents well. Now, I think I probably come across as a sort of a reasonably confident person uh, when I give talks. And you may be sort of saying to yourself, oh, it's easy for you, you know, you're tall, you wave your hands around, you've got long arms, it's sort of, it's easy for you to do this kind of stuff. I promise you, the only way anybody, anybody at all, including me, gets good at giving talks is practice. Um, it, it's practice, it's practice, it's practice. So, you know, if you're in the group, if you're in our group and our postdoc Barla hassles you to give a talk and, and, you, and you want to not give a talk, we're doing it for a very good reason. Because uh, the only way that you get good at giving talks is practice. Um, um, and and you know, it's, it, it's true for everybody. And it's not just your talk that needs to be practiced. You need to practice with talks. Um, so I've noticed this. So this year we had this paper that we got into the Information Retrieval Conference, me and another professor. We were very pleased with it, but it was a bit difficult. The concepts were a little bit tricky. And so I gave a version of the talk to our research group here at RMIT. And one of the students said to me afterwards, they just asked, they didn't say this talk's no good, they asked me a question, I thought, oh crap, we didn't quite get that right. And so I gave, a, I gave another version of the talk at another meeting, and that went much better, but, it's, but some of the questions at the end made me think we're still not getting it. And so then I gave the presentation again, and then I rewrote it for the conference. And so, and because one of the things is that explaining things can be difficult. Um, explaining concepts can take a while to work out what the best way to explain that concept is. So what I would urge from this slide is, you know, if you've got a talk, practice that talk and try to make that talk as great as you can be. But if once you've got that talk practiced, don't assume that's it. 
ask yourself whether you nailed it at that presentation. Chances are you'll be asked to give that talk again. Um, chances are I'll be asked to give this talk again, and there are some things I won't have got right today. So then you reflect and you say, right, are there more, you know, could I make this better? How could I make the talk better for the next time? Um, the other thing that's useful, and this is actually something I wrote in the abstract, and actually the, the most enjoyable part about writing this was when I was writing the abstract, I suddenly realized um, a key thing about giving talks. Um, the academic system is designed to critique your writing. Right, so the academic system um, gets you to write papers, and um, if your paper isn't well written, it'll get rejected by the conference or by the journal. And the reviewers will be cruel enough to tell you that you can't write. It's bloody awful when that happens, but at least they gave you some feedback. Um, and and um, but in in talks, there is no built-in mechanism in the academic system to critique your talks, which means that a lot of the talks at the conferences are pretty average and a lot of them are pretty crap, to be honest with you, because there is nothing in the academic system to actually provide that sort of feedback. The anonymous reviewer feedback is sometimes horrific when you submit a conference paper or a journal paper, but at least they're giving you feedback. So the other thing I would say is try to get feedback. Um, um, from people, if you can, about the talk. Now, that's very difficult. Um, you know, you go and ask someone afterwards, and you say, say, hey, what do you think of the talk? And say, oh, it was good. And, and that's usually all you get off them. Now, um, so Johanna and I know each other well enough um, that, for example, she will uh, tell me things that she didn't understand. And someone like Johanna is gold. Um, and I've been able to find, a, a, over time, a number of people who are willing to tell me straight. Um, I had a colleague when I was at Glasgow University who was a bastard, a fucking bastard, but he would tell you straight. If, he, if, you, if, if it was good, he would tell you it was good, and if he didn't understand it, he had no qualms in telling you, I didn't understand a word you were saying. And it, it hurt, it really hurt, but that sort of feedback really helped me uh, get better at giving talks. Um, and so what you want to try and find is someone who is willing to actually be honest with you and give you feedback. And if you can find someone like that, they're gold. They're absolute gold because they can give you, you know, quietly, doesn't have to be in front of anybody, it can just be a quiet word later. Um, if you can't find someone like that, then it tends to be a more difficult uh, set of things. So you have to kind of, as I said, when I gave a version of this talk, um, that summer school talk, uh, uh, that, that research uh, paper talk, I noticed that one of my students afterwards came and asked me a clarificatory question. I thought, oh, you should have got that in the talk. Shoot, you should have got that in the talk. And it's not, you're stupid, it's I didn't do the talk well enough. So you might get people asking you clarificatory questions or, or, um, or you may get no questions at the end of the talk. That's always a little worrying if no one asks you questions at the end of the talk, either because you're running out of time and they, they want to go and get a coffee, or, or it's because they didn't get it. So it, it's difficult. I don't have a perfect solution for you. The ideal is to find someone who is willing to be utterly honest. The other thing that we do you know, in our research seminars uh, for our group, we try to uh, give feedback as well. Um, in the seminar to the students and it is you know we sort of view ourselves as, as a bunch of friends in that group and then we want you to fail in our group and then succeed in the in the presentation but trying to find feedback is very useful uh, look you know something I could say is you know uh, it's very important to avoid reading from scripts uh, you know the audience sees what you're doing and they're just they're not impressed by what you do a a another common mistake that people can make probably not here but if you've got the laptop positioned here, um, if, I had, if this was the presenting laptop, quite often you'll see people do this. They'll point at the laptop. And, and it's, it's a simple, it's a nervous thing, right? Um, and practice will sort of help you get over your nerves. Um, but you know, it's perfectly fine to do this. It's all, totally all right to do this if you want to. Your voice may not carry because you're away from the microphone unless you've got a radio mic. 
but this is okay. If you've got a pointer, that's fine. If you want to move the mouse, let's just get it into the right space. Where's it gone? If you want to move the mouse, you can try doing that. Um, but you know, but you do see people actually pointing at the laptop. Um, so you know, some sort of obvious things. You'll notice that what I've please. Sorry. It, um, how do you handle the problem of um, the slides being there for posterity, but you're giving the talk in the moment, so you don't want to read from the slides yet. You want to slides to be somewhat complete? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and I'm not sure what the answer is. So, um, I, I haven't worried too much about leaving slides for posterity, so I guess my priority is to make sure the talk on the day is good. But there's no doubt that, for example, my slides are pretty minimal, the text is pretty minimal. Um, um, and so, um, I, and I've practiced this talk a bit, I hope it shows, I practiced this talk a bit so I don't need to be sort of um, um, looking at the text to prompt me to understand what I'm going to be saying. Um, I, there's perhaps a balance to be found, I would say that there's too much text here, but certainly if you're reading off the, off the slides, the, the audience are wondering why they bother turning up. Because if you're just reading from a script, they just don't understand what the point of the talk was. So um, I would, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, Bodo, it's a good question. I mean, the, the flip side might be that increasingly talks are, are, are videoed. Mm. And so it's not such a problem. Uh, so the entire package is collected rather than just having a slide deck lying around. You know, um, Think about how you speak, speak clearly, speak slowly. I've probably been speaking too fast today. Um, think about the right volume. Um, if you have a quiet voice, make sure you're close to the microphone, you know, sort of silly things like that. Um, but, but, but think about those things. So what have I talked about here? I've talked about you. And the main thing I said was that it's important to practice. Um, and I didn't really have a slide for this. Maybe I should have done in the next version. I'll make sure I do. It is nerve wracking doing this. You know, I didn't sleep that well last night because I was worrying about this talk. Um, it's nerve wracking doing things like this because you don't want to screw up in front of a bunch of people. So the way you deal with that is you practice. Because when you practice, even if you're nervous, it's just there in your head much, much more. And if you practice, one of the things that often happens uh, with a presentation is if you've not practiced enough, a slide will pop up and you go, shit, what was that slide about? <laughs> and, and, but if you practice, you know what slides are coming. And if you know what slides are coming, you adjust because you know this next thing is coming. So the practicing really, really helps. And, and you know, I've spoken to um, very senior people um, who have told me that that's just what they do. So I was writing in this morning, um, uh, I have got a long ride in. I was just in my head running some of the stuff over in my head. How do I make sure that I explain this as well as possible? So I actually need to be a little bit careful because I'm uh, running a bit out of time. So I'm just going to sort of make sure I, I skip through a couple of things. Look, techie stuff. Um, it's, you know, you obviously see people who screw up with, with techie stuff. This, this talk in particular, by the way, had sound. Sound is difficult. Um, I learnt coming to this uh, to this theatre. I was told it was an HDMI cable that I would have to plug my laptop in. This thing didn't work. There's no reason why it didn't work. It just didn't work. Uh, I came here about 15 minutes beforehand. Luckily, the guys in the back managed to call someone up. They brought a spare laptop, so you didn't notice that we screwed up. It's an HDMI cable. HDMI carries sound as well as video, except in this theatre, where it turns out you have to have a separate cable. Luckily, the people at the back said, is there sound? I said, yes. Um, why are you asking me? I've got the HDMI plugged in. So no, 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 let's get the headphone jack. And then they said, we just got to make sure something else is set up. And so the sound worked. Um, you know, silly things like making sure you've got your dongles. My wife bought me a makeup bag. Um, and all of my dongles sit in a makeup bag, which I sort of get out. And then, you know, and nothing gets lost. Uh, so this thing, for example, needed a dongle. Because uh, it's, you know, anyway. So. And then think about the theater, that's what I did today. I made sure that, that I understood how this place works. Um, there's some other minor things. If your talk, by the way, has weird fonts, 
Did you know that PowerPoint doesn't always save fonts when you save the, the, the PowerPoint presentation? There is an option deep in one of the save dialogues that embeds the font. You might sort of say, well, that's not a problem because I turned up with my laptop with the fonts all on it, except it got transferred to this five minutes before you arrived. So, you know, so there are sort of like, so there are some techie things that go on and it's just worth understanding the technicalities uh, in order to understand how to use the device. You know, this device also has, um, let me do, hang on. Beautiful. This device has, you know, a way of telling it whether it's only on the PC, is it only on the projector, do I duplicate the screens, do I have two screens? Just familiarize yourself with how that stuff works. It's not that hard, you're computer science PhD students, but you know, just make sure that you understand how that stuff works um, uh, and you'll just be able to give a better presentation. Um, all right, so um, um, as I said, I wanted to talk a little bit at the end about finishing on time. Um, you know, and as I said earlier, um, I've got this clock that's just sitting here. If you are running out of time, skip over things. I really had intended to spend more time on that technical stuff, but I'm running out of time. So let me spend a moment um, telling you a bit about some stories about people who give presentations that I think proves this idea that there are no other rules apart from finishing on time and making sure people get something out of it. And this photo is a good example about uh, what, what will this talk necessarily mean. So let me go through some rules that you might assume are required in talks. So one rule that you might implicitly assume is that there has to be five minutes left over for questions. Indeed, many people who give talks sort of hope that there's no time left for questions, but I promise you, if you make time for questions, that's your feedback as to whether the talk worked. This guy is Professor Andrew Turpin. He's a researcher up at the University of Melbourne, and he gave an astonishing talk in 2006 at our Information Retrieval Conference, the one in Seattle. I don't know if anyone was there. He was giving a presentation, it was actually work between him and a guy here at RMIT, and it was quite controversial. It was quite a controversial result, where they were showing that something that has been used for years wasn't working. I think Andrew was given 25 minutes to talk. He presented the entire thing in 10 minutes and left 15 minutes for questions. He was standing there in shorts. He was a proper Australian man. He had shorts, he had a t-shirt on, it was a huge audience, it was the opening session, and he had just told the entire community that this technique that they use, have used for decades, was showing very serious signs of not working. And he opened himself up for 15 minutes of questions. And they were fantastic questions. Did you do this experiment carefully? What did you think about this? Did you think about this thing? Yes, we did. Did you think about this thing? No, but I don't think that's that important. Did you, how about this? And we had 50, I was chairing the session. Um, it was superb. So good that at the conference this year, somebody mentioned Turpin's talk from 13 years ago. I, I, and just what a notable talk it was. It's a gutsy thing to say, I'm gonna give a 10 minute talk and leave 15 minutes open for questions. It was exactly the right thing to do. And it really worked. So you don't have to leave five minutes for questions. Do you need only one presenter? Um, no. It's not often that this makes sense, to be honest with you. Uh, these are my good friends. This is Heidi and this is Thomas. I've known them for years. We sometimes go, well, many years ago we went rock climbing. God knows who the guy at the back is. Um, <laughs> she is. She is the head of ITS in one of the universities in the UK. So she's a chief information officer. He is a professor of physics. They work in the same organization. Uh, it turns out that CIOs have conferences. So Heidi went to the CIO conference and brought her husband with her to give a talk about the challenges of being a chief information officer with a bunch of annoying academics. Now, if you know my friend Thomas, Thomas is very good at being annoying. And the two of them did, apparently, an astonishing double act where they just ran through some examples of you know, an academic asking questions, how the chief information officer might deal with those things, the back and forth, it was a riotously successful talk. I, I have tried this once in a, in a more informal setting with somebody I knew very well, and we both knew a topic extremely well, and we couldn't be bothered doing PowerPoint slides, 
we sat down a little bit before, we talked a little bit about some of the things we wanted to do, we arranged getting two microphones and we had this conversation on stage. And I would say it worked. It's not gonna work very often, but it, it, there are times when you can absolutely break that rule. Do you have to give the talk that you planned? Absolutely not. Um, this guy is Ed Hovey. He is a language technologies researcher. And 20 years ago, um, he and I were attending a very boring day in a hotel on the edge of Washington, D.C. The U.S. government had funded a research exercise on summarization of documents. And it was a dull, dull day. The talks were proving to be very samey. So someone would stand up and they would present their summarizer and they would show how they did on the standardized data set and then they would explain that they'd done well or they'd done badly. And you know, it was kind of getting a bit grim, you know, 20 minutes per talk. And Ed was due to speak sometime after lunch. And he just stood up, and by the way, he runs a stellar research group. I'm sure their group had done amazing things. And he said, he just didn't bother with the slides. He turned up, he had, a, in those days, you had these kind of uh, projectors where you could just write with a pen onto a blank sheet of, of transparency. And he just said, I've noticed something today. He said, there's basically two groups of, of systems here. There's the systems that my group built, which are very symbolic, and there's a bunch of statistical systems. And he said, the statistical systems are kicking the ass of the symbolic systems. Why is that happening? And so he then sort of proceeded to you know, moderate a question and answer session where, where the audience discussed. It's the best talk of the day, by far. So you know, this is someone who just went, do you know what, my talk doesn't matter. I should talk about something else. Now I understand, look, he looks confident, right? I understand that that's a, that's a tricky thing to take on. Um, um, and I don't know that I've ever abandoned the talk completely. But there are times when it makes sense to sort of say, well, actually, this connects with something else. You know, uh, earlier on today, we saw a presentation by blah, 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 and actually, this is a continuation of that. I was very lucky when I gave my presentation in the search engine conference this year, a, a, a previous speaker asked a, uh, had a question asked of them, and it turned out the problem they were describing was exactly the problem we were going to solve. So of course it made sense just to sort of say, by the way, if you saw the last speaker and they were talking about this, we're going to solve that. So you don't have to give the exact talk that you um, uh, were, were, have to do. I've never had the guts to do what he did, but it was exactly the right thing to do that day. And it really inspired me to think about ways of, of, making conf of making a talk connect with what else is going on. You, you're there on a day, you, know, you can think of it less as a sort of a, a, a presentation, it's more part of a conversation. If something is going on at the conference and you have something to connect to, why not? You know, if you have something to say about a previous presentation, why not do that? Um, do you need PowerPoint? This man believes you shouldn't. You probably don't know who this is because this is kind of a bit old school. Uh, this is guy is called Edward Tufta, who wrote a number of graphic design books. And he also wrote a diatribe against PowerPoint. He loathes PowerPoint. So he's a very successful graphic designer. And so if you go to a talk with Tufta, he requires you to buy one of his books. And then he gives his presentation where he tells you which page to look at. The reason he does this is because he says that PowerPoint doesn't have a high enough resolution. And a book has an intensely detailed level of resolution in it. And there are times when PowerPoint really struggles to convey the level of detail that you might want to get across. I've been to a talk once where somebody bought printouts of a very complex scatter plot, left them lying on the table, and some of us started kind of staring at these plots and we started having you know, observations about things that were sort of separate from what was going on in the presentation and it was very valuable to the presentation. Um, an example of something that we did earlier this year, we had to give a presentation to a company um, and uh, one of the students had created this fantastic report. It was about this thick and it was full of really cool stuff. 
And I could have given the presentation and said, by the way, student X created this great report, it's this thick. But instead what we did is we printed out several copies, we left them lying around, and just thought, well, maybe the people who are there will pick them up. One of them picked them up, one of them got a bit disconnected from the talk, started flicking through this thing and interrupted one of the speakers and said, by the way, this report's amazing. Have you seen the amount of stuff in here? There's so much detail, there's so much thought, so much care has gone into this. Now, I couldn't have got that through PowerPoint, but just lie, leaving stuff lying around doesn't work everywhere, but it can work at times. So you don't have to just use PowerPoint, right? There's no requirement to just use PowerPoint. This was not a good day, but do you actually even need to give a talk? So this is a bad story. So I was um, invited to give a series of lectures at a university, and I was a very lazy git uh, when I was invited to give this uh, set of uh, uh, lectures. And I hadn't written all of the lectures. And I had plans, they'd sent me the schedule, they said you're gonna have to give certain talks during the various levels of the day, uh, over several days, and on the last day, they wanted me to give a talk about the challenges of being a researcher. And I thought, God, what am I going to do for that? I don't know. I'll worry about it in a couple of days. I'll write it one of the nights. Um, and I'll be fine. And then uh, the second day when I was giving my lectures, they said, oh, by the way, we've changed the schedule. You're going to give that, uh, that how it is to be a researcher talk. And it starts in five minutes. I'm, I'm not kidding. I was like... Um, but I don't have any slides. And they said, well, what do you mean you don't have any slides? Well, we're gonna write them in two nights time. And they said, well, look, there's an audience of about this size waiting for you, you need to go. So, um, so what we did um, was I gave a, a little bit of a spiel at the start and then I just sort of said, are there any questions? And I, I waited for a moment um, and somebody put their hand up and they said, um, you know, there's this stuff about journals and conferences. You know, what's true? Is it true that journals are actually better venues than conference venues? And then, you know me, or if you know me, I love talking. I then started to talk about that thing. And the, the laptop was connected to the internet, so we were able to go and do some, uh, you know, looking at different things, looking at Google Scholar. And I ended up filling an hour and a half just by listening to questions. And it was actually a much better talk than any old nonsense I would have written. Um, so, you know, so now that's not going to work if you turn up at a conference. Um, but there is not, you know, but there are times, you know, and I do want to emphasize this about questions, it's valuable to leave time for questions so that people can actually guide you as to what the content should be. Um, um, is there anything else I wanted to say about that? I think that was probably. Um, no, that was it. So um, that was sort of the end of um, that little section about there being no other rules. Um, you know, it's just an illustration of some examples. So there isn't a requirement to leave five minutes at the end for questions. You can leave as much as you want or as little as you want. Better to leave it more, though. Um, you know, you can break away from the rules of there being one presenter. You know, I have seen people use two presenters. If it makes sense, it may, it may work. Um, I have certainly seen people break away from the restrictions of the talks that they've been given, uh, that they had already practiced, and vary it in some level. And there are times when that is a really, really good idea. Um, um, and then, you know, uh, the importance of questions is really what I emphasized there at the end. Um, what was that else I was going to say about this? Um, maybe that was it. Yeah, that'll do. So um, I will put these slides um, somewhere on, um, um, on a web page so Mo Xiaobong can guide me on that. Um, and what I've got is some examples. So I, I sent an email out somewhere um, for, um, for some suggestions of good talks. So this is from my wife. Uh, this is actually, so Art of Smart, they're Facebook videos. These are actually videos made somewhere here in Melbourne. They're for school kids, but they're pretty good. They talk a lot about, you know, uh, the ways that you give speeches, uh, body stance, clarity of speech. Um, 
uh, one of these is the chicken video, um, and then a couple of these are other people's ideas of sort of good presentations. One of them is um, <clears throat> uh, this presentation from Louis Van Aan, who, uh, uh, who uh, did some very good uh, HCI research. I think he gives very good talks. Oh yeah, and Falk uh, showed a, uh, one of these is a keynote from Neurix from a couple of years ago. Um, it runs for an hour, but Falk thought it was a really blinding talk. Um, 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 yeah, so, um, oh, what does that about? Um, okay, so, as I said, you know, I, I've already talked about these, um, I actually have no idea what that slide's about, so let's skip over it. So look, the final thing was just to, to really recap on this, which is to finish on time, which hopefully I'm doing, make sure the audience understands something, but really recognize that you have the ability to be much more flexible. Um, that most people assume there are no other rules. Now, you, you want to practice it because you, if you're going to try something a little non-standard, um, then that will be fine. I've given you that chicken video, and if you just stick to the chicken video, it's a perfectly fine way of presenting. That sort of structured, that order, that recapping, those discourse markers, that works. Um, but there is definitely opportunities to try other things. Um, loads of opportunities to try other things. Um, you just have to practice and, and give them a go. Um, and I think with that, um, that's me, so I'll finish there. Thanks. <laughs>